Well, thank you all very much. Many, um, many thanks to, uh, many thanks, many thanks to Professor Clements, who I understand will be Congressman Clements eventually in the, uh, um, That would be a useful thing. Um, <laughs> look, um, all those introductions were far too kind. And, and um, in fact, I feel always on a day like this a little guilty. I mean, it's an incredibly beautiful day, one of the last maybe beautiful fall days before the beauty of winter asserts itself, you know. Um, um, and here I have called you all inside into this <laughs> pleasant but somewhat windowless bunker and um, and and uh, and I am faced with the realization that my job on earth is essentially to bum people out you know um, and so I apologize in advance for that and I, I will try to get through the bad stuff quickly um, and on to more hopeful stuff. But really, there is no point in talking about any of this until we're pretty much on the same page about the pace and the scale of the trouble we're in, because the pace and the scale of the trouble determines the pace and the scale of the kind of solutions, the action that we need. Now, I wrote the first book, as Paul said, about climate change for a general audience 25 years ago, back when I was a young man. And at the time, it was still an abstract proposition. We knew enough to know that when you burned coal and gas and oil, you put CO2 into the atmosphere, and that the molecular structure of that carbon dioxide trapped heat that would otherwise radiate back out to space. And we had a pretty good idea what was going to happen, but we didn't know how quick and we didn't know how hard it would pinch. And the story of the intervening quarter century is it's pinching a lot faster and a lot harder than we understood that it would. Um, so far, human beings have raised the temperature of the Earth about a degree Celsius, which doesn't sound like that much. And in some ways, it's not that much. Uh, the extra heat that that carbon is trapping amounts to about three quarters of a watt per square meter. So about less than one of those small white Christmas tree lights per square meter of the Earth's surface. Okay? The rub is there are a lot of square meters on the Earth's surface. And so that adds up. Uh, another measure of how much extra heat we're adding is that it's the heat equivalent daily of about 400,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs, okay? But that's abstract, too. It's easier to sort of think about what it's done, all that extra heat so far. Uh, look at the Arctic. Um, the Arctic Ocean is, by the end of last summer, 80% uh, of the sea ice that was there 40 years ago had melted. In essence, we'd taken one of the biggest physical features on Earth and we'd broken it. Uh, and the other one's close behind. The oceans are about 30% more acidic than they were 40 years ago. That's a staggering change as the chemistry of seawater changes. It absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. There was a study last week, in fact, saying that that was proceeding uh, in, 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 at a pace faster than anything we've been able to measure for the last 300 million years. Okay? Uh, on land, the thing we notice um, most, I think, is changes in hydrology and the way that water moves around the planet. If you want one fact to understand what's happening in this century, it's simply that warm air holds more water vapor than cold, so the atmosphere on average is about 5% wetter than it was 40 years ago, which loads the dice for drought and for flood, and both of which we see in great abundance. If for some reason you don't trust the scientific community on this, then ask the insurance industry, the people in our economy that we ask to analyze risk for us, and they will tell you in exactly the same kind of alarm tones about what is going on. 
Um, at this point, really, you'd have to be pretty blind not to see it, to have watched what happened when we had the hottest year in American history last year, 2012. And it got too hot to grow grain across much of the richest farmland on earth, across the, the Midwest of the United States, uh, to watch in October when Hurricane Sandy crept up the eastern seaboard, the lowest barometric pressure ever recorded north of Cape Hatteras, the largest wind field we've ever measured, and it drove the Atlantic Ocean into the New York City subway system. Those pictures looked like something out of a movie, but it wasn't a movie, it was real. And desperate as that was, uh, you know, it's probably not the worst thing of its kind that we're experiencing. In fact, as we sit here today, there is a massive, and I mean massive, cyclone bearing down on the India-Bangladesh border in the Bay of Bengal. Um, um, so we should keep folk in our prayers. Um, um, this is the beginning of what climate change looks like. This is what happens when you raise the temperature one degree. The same scientists who told us that would happen now tell us with robust confidence that unless we get off coal and gas and oil far faster than any government currently plans, that one degree will be three or four degrees long before the century is out. In fact, yesterday there was a remarkable paper in Nature. Um, um, uh, and what it said was that by 2047, 2047, uh, every place, every place on Earth, the temperature will be hotter than it's ever been before. That um, the coldest year in by 2047 will be warmer than the hottest year ever recorded in the past. As the scientist who put together the study said, go back in your life to think about the hottest, most traumatic event you have ever experienced. What we're saying is that very soon that event is going to become the norm, okay? So think about 2047. I'm 52 years old. If I'm doing the math right, uh, students who entered college this year as freshmen will be 52 in 2047 or thereabouts. Um, um, that's a broken world that we are going to leave them unless we act very, very, very quickly. A world that we simply can't successfully inhabit. The agronomists tell us, there was a big study from Stanford and the University of Washington, that from this point on, each degree increase in global average temperature should cut grain yields 10%. So if you raise temperature 3 degrees, there's 30% fewer calories on the planet. You all know enough about it how the world works to know what that means for development, for the rights of women, for war and peace, for public health, for any of the things that we ostensibly care about. Um, we can't let it happen. It's by far the biggest thing that human beings have ever done and the biggest crisis that we've ever faced and we need to go to work on it. And I'm not going to tell any more bad things. Um, I'm through it. Um, I want to talk now about what we're going to do about it and what we're going to do, what we might be able to do. And when I do that, I'm not going to waste much time talking about technology and engineering because that's the easy part, okay? We know how to do what we need to do. We're seeing examples of it around the world in the few places that are actually trying. Germany's the one big country that's taken this seriously enough to really put resources behind it. There were days this summer when Germany generated half the power it used from solar panels within its borders. Okay? And that's Germany. I wager few people in this room have ever, you know, gotten to February and thought, oh, I need a sunny vacation. I think I'll go to Germany, you know. Um, 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 Think, think what a country could do that had, oh, I don't know, Florida, California, Texas, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, uh, places like that to work with. Um, but there are more solar panels in Bavaria than there are in the United States, okay? And that's because we lack the political will 
to get this job done, and we lack the political will for a particular purpose, uh, for a particular reason. The fossil fuel industry, the richest industry we've ever had in our, I mean, I'm no hyperbole here. Exxon made more money last year than any company in the history of money, okay? Um, and in our system, it doesn't take, uh, you know, th that kind of money is, is I don't, I'm, maybe I, I don't know if I'm telling you guys a secret or not, but, but money um, turns out to command more political power than it should, okay? And that kind of money is enough to keep things from getting done, which is changing, which is the easiest thing to do, to stop things from happening. And so far, it's been plenty. So far, it's been plenty to guarantee that we have had a 25-year bipartisan effort to accomplish nothing in Washington, and it's been successful, okay? And, 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 and that's why we're in the trouble we're in. So, the question is, what to do about it? And I, I, here I move from fact and statistic to um, guess, because I'm not by nature an activist, I'm by nature a writer. In fact, this is the furthest, uh, you know, writers are intro. It's very nice to be here with you all, but given my druthers, I'd really rather be home typing. You know, that's what I <laughs> like to do, and it's only because at a certain point, it became clear to me that reason, we'd won the argument long ago, we were just losing the fight, and it didn't really seem to me that writing another book was going to move the needle on this, and so instead we started to think about, look, we can't outspend the fossil fuel industry, so what are we gonna do instead? What currency can we work in? And the only ones that we could come up with, the only currency was well, the currencies of movements, passion, spirit, creativity. Sometimes we need to spend our bodies. Um, we formed this thing, 350.org, five years ago. And it was myself and seven college undergraduates. So undergraduates, listen uh, carefully because it's entirely possible for you all to have great effect. Um, we took the name 350.org because our greatest climate scientist, Jim Hansen, had just produced a paper saying, we know enough about carbon in the atmosphere to know how much is too much. Any value greater than 350 parts per million is not, as they put it, compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. That's strong language for scientists to use. It is stronger still when you know that outside today, whether you are in Michigan or you are in Mongolia, the atmosphere is closing in on 400 parts per million CO2, going up two parts per million per year. That's why the Arctic melts. That's why the oceans acidify. That's why, you know, we have horrific drought, why we have record wildfire flood. Um, too high already. So it was a depressing paper to read, but the reason we read it with some relish, in a sense, was because it provided a number to work with. And we wanted to go organize globally, and so a number was a good thing, because one of the problems with organizing globally is, you know, everyone insists on speaking their own language everywhere, and that makes it hard, but Arabic numerals cross those linguistic boundaries, and so 350 means the same thing. In, Kalamazoo and in Kathmandu, and 350 mean the same thing. And so we went to work. That was lucky that we had that advantage because we didn't have too much else. We had no money and we had no lists or anything and we had myself, a writer, and seven college undergraduates. So it was somewhat ludicrous. However, there are seven continents, so each one of them took one. Um, <laughs> the one. The one who... Uh, took the Antarctic, also had to take the internet, and um, <laughs> off we went to work. And our work was to find people like ourselves. Now, s you know, not every place in the world is there a, um, somebody called an environmentalist, but every place in the world there's somebody working on social justice, on human rights, on war and peace, on, on public health, on hunger, and those were our natural allies because those are the things that can't happen in a degrading world. So we looked around and asked people, would you come and help with this? And we had no idea how well we'd do. 
We picked a day in October of 2009, about a year after we'd started, to kind of have the coming out party and ask people to do something that day to take this number and put it into the information bloodstream of the planet. And we didn't know if it would work. We got the first sense that it might two days early. We were sitting around our office and doing the last minute stuff, our one room office, and the satellite phone rang and it was our leader in Ethiopia, who like many of our leaders was a she, and um, like many of our leaders was 17. And she was in tears and she said the government took away our permit for Saturday, so we're doing it today before they can stop us. That, that was brave, but that wasn't why she was in tears. She was, she was sad. Um, she said, we said, we want to do it the same day as everybody else. We want to be part of the whole big thing. We didn't want to jump the gun and spoil it for people. We want to do it the same time as everybody else. But, she said, um, there are 15,000 young people right now out in the street in Addis Ababa chanting 350. So we said, wow, well, don't worry about the date. It's okay, you know. <laughs> um, and um, for the next 96 hours or so, the pictures just flooded in. The next one was U.S. troops in Afghanistan. They made a 350 with sandbags. They sent a note saying, we're parking our Humvee and walking. But I'm going to show you just a couple of these pictures. Before the weekend was over, there had been 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries. CNN called it the most widespread day of political activity in the planet's history. Um, and I'll just show you a few of the pictures mainly to show you, those of you who are doing this work, involved in this fight, or want to be, show you who your brothers and sisters in this work are. Now, one of the things I'd always heard in my life was that environmentalists were rich white people, and that if you had to worry where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist. And that just turned out to be complete nonsense. Most of the people leading this effort around the world turned out to be poor and black and brown and Asian and young because that's what the world is mostly consists of and, and uh, turns out that they're as interested in the future as anybody else, maybe more so because the future bears down really hard on you in those places and I mean some of them were in really poor places. That's someplace on the Congo River above Kinshasa near where Conrad in his Eurocentric way, identified the heart of darkness on our planet, you know. And they obviously didn't have much money, they didn't even have a digital camera, they developed it in a home dark room and it didn't come out so well, so they put in, wrote in what their banner had said, but, but, but to see them there fully engaged in a part of this fight, leading this fight, um, was to me a good sign. There was creativity uh, and, 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 you know, uh, 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 of all kinds, and um, <laughs> great involvement of religious communities for the first time in this work. There's the head of Muslim South Africa, next to them the sort of leader of indigenous traditions, behind them in scarlet, Desmond Tutu's successor as Anglican Archbishop, at the head of a big multi-faith march, you know, there's our biggest evangelical college in this country, Billy Graham's alma mater. I'd been to Bethlehem to do some organizing, a hard place to get to at the moment, but the Dead Sea is shrinking very rapidly, among other reasons because the temperature is rising, so people wanted to do something. Too many military checkpoints in the way, so the Jordanian said, we'll make the big three on our beach, the Palestinian said, we'll do the five in Palestine, the Israelis the zero on our shore, you know. Um, 300 big demonstrations across China, not an easy place to do this. One of them got broken up by the police, but the others went off. And China's fascinating part of this equation. Um, those are our really beloved brothers and sisters in the Maldive Islands, in the Indian Ocean, a okay, Muslim nation. 1,200 islands spread across uh, archipelago across the equator. It's a 5,000-year-old culture, continuous 5,000-year-old culture. The odds of it getting to 5,100 are pretty small because the highest point in the archipelago is about a meter and a half above sea level, okay? For the 10,000 years that human beings, we've had civilizations, that's been okay. We've been in the Holocene, a period of benign climatic stability, but we have forced this planet out of the Holocene, and so now a meter and a half above sea level is no longer a safe place to be, but they are fighting like crazy. This was the lead story on Google News for about 36 
hours, more stories linking to it than anything else, and I think one reason was that people didn't look the way that newspaper editors thought environmentalists were supposed to look like. I mean, every woman in that zero is in full black burqa, so to us, they do not look like members of the Sierra Club, but in fact, their hearts are in the same place. They are thinking about the future, not about themselves. They're doing the right thing. Uh, those guys, that's the oil-rich sheikdom of Abu Dhabi. And you can actually see some oil-rich shakes down front. But they're um, smarter than your average oil guy. Behind them, you can see the edge of the world's largest solar array. Um, I think their intention is to remain rich no matter what. And um, <laughs> uh, more power to them. Um, there were also three or 400 pictures that ended up in a file just marked 350 adorable. And they were... They were adorable, and they were also hard to look at. Um, those girls are probably going to be refugees in the course of their lives, and not through any fault of their own. So we've gone on doing this work, and you know, I can show you pictures for, there are about 40,000 pictures in our Flickr account. We've done now about 20,000 demonstrations and rallies in every country on Earth except North Korea. Um, and it's been beautiful, fun work to do. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to kind of help spread these messages around the planet and to show what it looks like and to see people, yeah, it's pretty brave people everywhere, you know, and places I'd never heard of before, um, places that I had heard of but in completely other contexts, um, um, you know, just wonderful. And we've done a lot of art, too. Paul talked about, we did this day that they described as the largest art project on earth because, I mean, we just came from a wonderful art show, a student art show here about climate change that I recommend you all go see. I wish I could remember what the name of the hall was, where it was. South Corman? South Corman. Um, I knew someone would know the answer to that. Um, um, but we did this one, these so many people, those are several thousand people in the Dominican making an image, now altogether too familiar image, of someone having to flee through the roof of their house. So big you had to have a satellite to, to really capture them. Those are solar panels on the desert in Egypt. Those are our friends in Iceland. That was my, maybe my favorite one, a, a now dry riverbed in Santa Fe, you know, now that we're... Um, got a huge drought underway in the southwest. But when the satellite came over, two or 3,000 people whipped blue blankets over their head for a second to kind of bring the river back to life. So it's beautiful to see. And it's important to do this kind of work and, 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 and to bring all this message to lots of places where it's not known. But in the end, it's nowhere near enough. Um, nor is it enough, though it's very good, to do the right things around our house, or around our campus. This is a campus that has done a lot of good things. There's electric cars all over the place and cool stuff happening in an old venerable recycling program. All this stuff is really good and important. But we're actually at the stage where we can't make the math, the climate change work anymore with individual changes like that alone. This is a structural, systemic problem, and it means standing up to power. And power doesn't concede change easily. Um, it only concedes it if you fight for it. And so in the last couple of years, we've tried to be taking this movement that we're sort of building and, and put it to work trying to fight. Um, some of you may have heard about this Keystone Pipeline fight. Now, no one knew about it two years ago when it really started. Well, that's not true. The only people who knew about it and the people who had been bravely fighting to call attention to what was going on up in the tar sands were the people who lived up there, the indigenous First Nations people up in Alberta and really across much of the continent. And they were talking about the horror of that tar sands mining up there. And I've been up there. I was up there with our Cree friends for a walk across this country not that long ago, and it's horrible. I mean, unbelievable. I, I've seen a lot of bad environmental sites in my life, but nothing quite like it. For those of you who are Tolkien fans, it's basically Mordor. Um, um, it couldn't be much worse. Um, 
They have the biggest tailing ponds in the world where the polluted water is held back and by huge, enormous dams, and they have to fire cannons, boom, 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 every few seconds, day and night, because if any bird ever lands on those ponds, it dies instantly. It feels like, it sounds like there is a war underway against nature up there, and nature is losing. So that was good to be able to get engaged in that fight and fast. Um, and then um, um, to take it beyond the fight over just that place and into the fight over the climate. Because the tar sands up there in Canada have so much carbon in them that if we could burn them all tonight, Jim Hansen at NASA calculated, the atmospheric concentration of CO2 would rise from 400 parts per million, already too high, to 540 parts per million. As he put it, uh, it would be essentially game over for the climate. And so this pipeline, which the president has the power himself to block by himself, seemed worth fighting, even though everyone told us it was a done deal and there was no chance. But then 1,253 people went to jail in the biggest civil disobedience action about anything in 30 years. And then it spread. Uh, around the world, you know, people, big civil disobedience in Canada and then in consulates and embassies all over the place. And then we went back, we surrounded the White House with five deep, shoulder to shoulder with people, very polite. Every single sign was just a quote from Barack Obama in 2008. Um, time to end the tyranny of oil. In my administration, the rise of the oceans will begin to slow. And we said, you have the power to stop this thing. This time, you don't have to ask John Boehner or Fred Upton or anybody for permission. You just can go and do it. And he said, well, at least I'll take a year and think about it some more. And so it's been delayed now for a while. And they'll make a decision sometime in the next six months. And we hope you'll push the president to do the right thing. Because if he does, then it'll be the first time any world leaders ever stopped a big project because of its effect on the climate. And that would matter, not matter only for its carbon content, though that's large. It would matter because it would be a marker laid down to the rest of the world and a way to restart the climate talks that failed at Copenhagen uh, in 2009. Somebody sometime is going to have to say, we're not going to dig up every bit of carbon we got in the ground, and it might as well start here. Um, that's not the only fight that's going on. There are many, many other things like it. There's other pipelines, this Enbridge pipeline down that'll come through this part of the world. There are coal ports they want to build in the Pacific Northwest. I've just come back from Australia where people are fighting hard to block huge new coal mines. Um, you know, we're off to uh, Eastern Europe soon where there's the same kind, I mean, just all around the world, lots of places where we got to play defense. But we also have to play offense if we're going to win here. Um, it's important to play offense too, and that's why 10 months ago we launched this big divestment campaign all around this country that's now spreading around the world. And we've been asking people at churches and mosques and synagogues in city governments, especially at colleges and universities, if they would please if they would please sell their stock in the fossil fuel industry, stop profiting from the wreckage of the climate, stop being a party to this, you know? If you own stock... <laughs> if you own stock in Chevron, then you helped give the biggest campaign, corporate campaign donation ever. Uh, post Citizens United two weeks before the last election to make sure that the House of Representatives stayed in the hands of climate deniers and we never got anywhere and it was successful. You know, that's why we're not going to get any action in Washington for a little while. We need people to stop doing this. And the good news is that people are. Uh, Oxford University published a study two days ago saying this is now the fastest growing divestment movement in history. Faster even than 25 years ago when I bet some people in this room worked in the effort to get stock divested from companies doing business in South Africa. That effort, which took some years, was extraordinarily important. It was Nelson Mandela, when he got out of prison, who came first to the University of California, 
first place you went to say thank you. We liberated ourselves, but you helped. We needed that kind of pressure. And it was Mandela's great accomplice, Desmond Tutu, who asked us to take up this weapon again. He said, if you could see what is happening in Africa with drought and famine from climate change that we've done nothing to contribute to, Africa burns less than 1% of the world's fossil fuel, if you could see that, you'd know why we want you to take up this call again. So in the first 10 months or so, we already have seven or eight schools that have divested colleges and universities. Um, we have, from San Francisco State on the west coast to the College of the Atlantic on the east, we have um, many big cities, Seattle, San Francisco, Portland, Providence. We have a bunch of religious institutions, denominations. Earlier this summer, the United Church of Christ, our oldest Protestant denomination, traces its roots back to the pilgrims said it was no longer going to invest in fossil fuel companies because it wasn't okay to pay the pastor by investing in firms that were running Genesis in reverse, you know? Um, 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 and it's not okay. And it's not okay for even schools like this to be doing that. So I hope very much that y'all will join the hundreds of other campuses where people are working hard on this issue. And... and um, It may, it may take a few years, but that's okay because the fight is as good as the win, you know. It's as important to be using this as a moment, a vehicle for explaining to everybody what's happening to this planet and why it's so important and who it is that's keeping us from making the kind of change we need, you know. Um, you need to do it because, because, well, because we can do it. Um, we asked... Um, well, let, let, let me go back a picture. We, we, the spring before last, the Heartland Institute, which is a big fossil fuel front group, put up a series of billboards trying to, you know, fight against action on climate change as usual. And the conceit of the billboards, there was another one with Charles Manson, I think, was that serial killers believed in global warming. And I think the logic was, therefore, everyone who believed in global warming was a serial killer. Um, it's not very sound logic. I mean, it's like Adolf Hitler believed in gravity, you know, or whatever. But, but it was designed to do what they always try to do, to sort of um, um, marginalize people. Um, marginalize, in this case, physicists and chemists and, and, and people. So we were really happy that the same day, by coincidence, I guess, that they were doing this, we had already long scheduled this big global thing we were calling Connect the Dots. And we'd asked people all over the world, all over the world, to rally in places that had felt the sting of climate change and send the message. And the pictures by the thousands rolled in. You know, the day begins in the far Pacific, so the first ones came from underwater off the Marshall Islands, where the coral reef, like coral reefs everywhere, is just disappearing. It cannot deal with the hot, more acidic ocean that we're asking it to deal with. The coral reef scientists say it must be mostly gone by mid-century. One whole corner of God's brain, you know, just wiped out. You would think people in Afghanistan had other things to worry about, but the Kabul River running dry is a pretty big deal. Uh, there's a lot of that drought going on all over the world. Um, there's sea level rise in lots of places. Some places, the you know, problems are less absolutely life or death, but if you like to ski, the disappearance of winter matters, you know. Um, um, I, you know. Wildfire is now a regular feature of the boreal north. There have been the last two summers um, 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 big fires, three and four degrees of latitude north of where we've ever seen them before. It's just gotten hot and dry enough for that to happen. Um, um, people having to evacuate their homes as sea level rises. That top red balloon is where the level of the Dead Sea used to be. Um, that picture came from one of we have a strong organization in India, 350 India. So there were a lot of pictures from India, and that one just stuck in my mind because it came with a note, and all the note said was, "There is no water behind our dam anymore." Um, these people had the opposite problem. They're in that zone in Pakistan 
where in 2010 there was absolutely record rainfall, of just astonishing rainfall in the headwaters up in the Khyber Pass of the Indus River, the kind of rain you can only have now that we've changed the moisture holding ability of the atmosphere. And by the time the rain had washed down through, 25% uh, of the nation of Pakistan was underwater. 20 million people had to leave their homes. It's, it's as if Hurricane Sandy had caused everybody between Baltimore and Boston to have to evacuate. I mean, it's not even really imaginable quite, but there they were, you know. Um, and my guess is they had precious little to do with causing it, most of them. Um, you know. Here's Vermont. We're still recovering where I live from Hurricane Irene. Um, farm fields still silted in and covered with rock. And, but the same everywhere, you know. Um, um, that may have been my picture that hit me the most. Probably the smallest demonstration of the day. Just some street now turned into a muddy river in Haiti. Um, but I, I, it got me because of what the sign said there on the end. And I don't know if you can quite read it, but that boy and the girl said, your actions affect me, okay? which is true. More people died from Hurricane Sandy in Haiti than in New York. I mean, there's still a cholera outbreak underway there in its wake. Um, your actions affect me, but not in reverse. There's really nothing that people in Haiti can do to effectively solve this problem. They can't burn less fossil fuel because they don't really burn any now. They don't have the headquarters of the big fossil fuel industries close to hand. They can't take a bay day's bus ride and be at the, you know, able to get arrested outside the sole superpower, you know, physical address. They don't have. Um, endowments that they can divest from fossil fuel. That's us who have that. And so it's our duty to act. And I, I mean, I won't belabor the point. I'll just, um, I'll just, you know what? I'll just finish up by telling you two quick things about that, those civil disobedience we did in Washington, because we were talking about it a little earlier. Um, I wrote the letter that asked people to come to Washington and get arrested, which is not an easy kind of letter to write. So I got a lot of other people to sign it with me, you know, uh, Danny Glover and Wendell Berry and Naomi Klein and lots of people. But one of the things I said in the letter was, um, I don't think young people should have to be the cannon fodder here. As you've seen from these pictures, young people, college students, younger, they're leading the fight most of the time around most of the world. And that's good. That's as it should be. They're going to suffer the most from all of this, and it's good that they're involved. But you know what? If you're 22 right now in our economy, it's possible that an arrest record is a kind of suboptimal item for your resume. Um, one of the few unmixed blessings of growing older is, past a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you, you know? And so it was, it was with it was with some pleasure that we watched people arrive in D.C., and a lot of them had hairlines like mine. You know, we did not say to people, how old are you, as they were getting arrested, because that would be rude. But we did, I think, cleverly say, who was president when you were born? <laughs> and the two biggest groups were from the FDR and the Truman administrations, okay? On the last day, there was a guy arrested with a sign around his neck that said, World War II vet, handle with care. He'd been born in the Warren Harding administration. Now, I actually even studied some American history when I was in school, but I'd forgotten there was a Warren Harding administration. <laughs> it was long enough ago. Um, the point is, young people, it was very nice to see your elders acting like elders for a while, you know? Um, doing, doing the thing that in a real culture, um, um, elders do, you know, lead. Um, the other thing we asked was, um, if you want to come get arrested, would you please put on a necktie or a dress? Now, not, I mean, I wore a necktie tonight to be proper, but really, where I live in Vermont, um, I mean, you can go many years without putting on a necktie, so that wasn't the thing. It's that we wanted to make, sort of underscore a point that I've been trying to make all night, 
which is really, there's nothing radical at all about what we're asking for here, nothing at all. All we're asking for is a world that worked the way the one we were born onto worked, the way the one that every human being that we know about, to have any history of for the last 10,000 years was born onto. That's not a radical demand. If you think about it, that's a very conservative demand. Radicals work at oil companies. If you're willing to get up in the morning and make more money than anybody ever made before you by altering the chemical composition of the atmosphere, okay, then you're engaged in an act far more radical than any human being ever before you ever thought of engaging, you know? I mean, I know that I don't know, maybe down at Ann Arbor or something, there were some 60s radicals and things, but, but none of them ever thought, I'm going to change the temperature of the earth, you know? <laughs> um, this is craziness that these guys are engaged in. It is radicalism of the highest and most dangerous order, and we have to just check it as fast as we can. That's what we're called upon to do in our moment. That's our task. And, And, and I will finish, because I'm not, in the end, I'm not really an activist, I'm basically just a writer. I will finish by telling you the truth, which maybe is not the best thing always to do for activists, but I will do it, which is, I don't know if we're actually going to win this fight or not, okay? Um, you know, most times when people are fighting for social justice, it's really hard, but there's some presumption that the world is moving in the right direction. Dr. King always said at the end of his talks, quoting, I think, from Theodore Parker, he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. This may take a while, but we're going to get there, okay? Um, now, of course, people in the civil rights movement had to be far braver than we have to be. You know, no one is shooting you for talking about global warming. Um, but... Um, <laughs> But they did have that luxury of a certain kind of optimism, you know. The arc of the physical universe is short, and it is bending toward heat. And that means that if we don't win soon, we will not win. Um, it will be a moot point. That makes it hard sometimes. I don't know if we're going to win. No one can know. We're going to need to catch some breaks from physics along the way if we're going to win. But I do know something I didn't know five years ago. And I have no doubt about it because of how much time I've spent out in all these places I've shown you. I have no doubt that we're going to fight. Um, that it's going to be a big fight. And that fight is underway. And we need you very much, very much to be a part of it. And it'll be an honor just to get to stand shoulder to shoulder with you in that fight. Thank you all very much. No need. No need. I, please, please. Now, I know many of you, I know many of you need to leave and get out into this pretty night, and that's just fine. I won't be offended. But if there's, we, do we have time for? Did I talk so long that maybe we have time for a couple questions anyway? Good, we have time for questions, and there's a microphone there. And is there one over there? There is one over there also. And, and there's one on each side, the right side and the left side. And um, questions or comments or, you know, abuse of any kind. I let you guys have it full bore, so I'm, it's game, fair game to let me have it. Yes, you shout out and I'll repeat it since you're a long way from a microphone. Yes. It seems to me the fundamental problem, and I'm a retired psychiatrist after 40 years of trying to help people with stress related to their illnesses, only to discover that the basis for it is population pressure. Mm. It's not the fundamental problem is overpopulation of the earth by humans. No, I think not. Um, it's an issue in a sense. I wrote a book about population some years ago called Maybe One, an Argument for Smaller Families, and it argued that we might want to think in our society about having fewer children. Um, 
because Americans take a big toll on the world around us. But in fact, population is one of the places where we've done a pretty good job. You know, six, 30 years ago, the average woman on this earth had six children. That number is now 2.4 and falling. And it's been almost entirely the work of people in the developing world. And what they figured out was that when you educated women and empowered them to one degree or another, fertility fell very quickly. People wanted to have fewer children and were able to. So yes, the population is going to continue to increase some for the next 30 or 40 years because there's a kind of demographic bulge, people coming into their childbearing years, and even if they're having one or two kids, the, but there's no, that's, that's just going to happen. And it you know, should happen. We can't stop people from having kids. Um, um, and at any rate, it's not the thing that's driving climate change for the most part. Most of that population growth is coming in places that are so poor that um, they use almost no energy. We tend to forget how big the gulf is. The average American uses more energy between the stroke of midnight on New Year's Eve and dinner on January 2nd than the average sub-Saharan African uses in the course of a year, okay? So, you know, that means that, that, that in this context, it's not their fault in any way. I mean, they're a sort of rounding error in those calculations, okay? Um, um, the problem we have now is rapidly rising consumption in places with essentially flat uh, uh, populations, think China, uh, because they're starting to consume like Americans. They're never going to catch up with us and consume as much, but they're headed in that way, and it just turns out the world can't tolerate you know, more people consuming like Americans. That doesn't mean that, that a useful answer would be to tell everybody else in the world to stop while we continued, okay? Uh, it means that we have to change up our act pretty fast in a lot of interesting ways, especially the ways we use energy and hope that we can spread that quickly around the rest of the world. So I, I think population represents some, one of the examples of human beings rising to the occasion. Um, and one hopes that we can figure out ways. We don't know quite what the thing that's the equivalent of female education for changing the consumption curve, but we suspect that it at least begins with finally putting a price on carbon to make energy reflect the damage that it does in the atmosphere. And if we did that, then we'd begin to see real change. And we can do that in ways that don't bankrupt anybody. I mean, the smartest Method for doing that is what people now call fee and dividend, where you'd put a big honking tax on fossil fuel at the wellhead. You'd make Exxon pay a huge amount of money, you know, to reflect the fact that they're wrecking the earth. And um, then you would just take that big tax and send a check to everybody in America for their share every month. So they'd still get the signal at the pump that the price of gas had gone way up which is a good signal to get. It's the reminder that we do not need a semi-military vehicle to go to the grocery store, you know? Um, um, but, but people would be made whole. 80% of Americans would come out ahead in that scheme. The only people who wouldn't are people who use way too much energy. If you have a Learjet, then you would not come out ahead, but you shouldn't because having a Learjet is a um, socially awkward thing to be doing in a, <laughs> the age of climate change. You ask and I'll repeat, or you can... I was wondering if you could make the connection between private property, a for-profit economy, and the environmental crisis using whatever definition for radicalism you prefer. Sure. I mean, the question is, what's the connection between a private economy and a for-profit economy and climate change? My tendency is, my thinking on this, which is incomplete, but it's a, if you read a book called Deep Economy that I wrote, you'll have a, some sense of it. My sense is that, um, even more important than our, that, that our ideologies about the world, including much of our kind of economic sense of the world, 
is more determined by the availability of cheap fossil energy than the other way around. I think it's, I think it's significant that Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations 30 years after James Watt invented the steam engine and not before, okay? Um, that is, I think suddenly having that availability, that, that was the thing that changed the world. And so I think the thing that will change the world in different directions is when we move toward different sources of energy uh, more than anything else. Fos things like sun and wind are very different inherently from fossil energy, which is concentrated in a few places and leads to great centralized, not only combustion, but centralized wealth, you know, and the power that comes with it. The sun and the wind are different. They are spread out around the world. They are ubiquitous, but diffuse. And so to capture them, we need what the engineers call distributed generation. And I think that leads much more naturally in the direction of decentralized wealth and power too, you know, to a much more democratic world. My sense is that that's the likeliest way to break up some of the um, concentrations of wealth and power that we see in this planet. It's why it's been so easy for us to, I think, to overlap, at least for me, to sort of overlap and work with people who are doing things like Occupy and stuff, because um, at the heart, um, these things are very, very, very connected, as you point out. Thank you. Is there a question over there? Um, I was wondering what you think is best to uh, fight climate change denial and complacency. In particular, I've noticed that people edit on Wikipedia. There's a lot of people who hide information or obscure it. Um, the founder of it is a libertarian, for example. Well, you know, I mean, this is a good question. Um, there's, uh, the good news is about 70% of Americans now understand that we're in serious trouble from climate change, okay? That's what the polling data shows. I can't take credit, full credit, for having produced that educational revolution. Mother Nature's done most of the educating. 85% of American counties have had a federally declared disaster in the last two years, you know? And at a certain point, it's just like, who are you gonna believe? Fox News or your own lying eyes, you know? Um, but, um, um, that leaves 20, 25% of people who are unwilling to grapple with the science. I don't think it really is all that profitable to spend an immense amount of time trying to get the last 20% of people on board. I think what really is much more profitable is to take, find the people who do know what's going on and get some significant percentage of them actually really active and out there. I think we've got more than enough people to win this fight, they're just not engaged. And so trying to win over, I mean, if you've spent the last 20 years marinating in Rush Limbaugh, the odds that you're going to sort of get this all of a sudden are small, you know? Um, so better to, you know, sort of go with, um, go with, People can, you know, who can get it, I think. That's my sense. But that means that people who do get it have to act, and they have to act sort of bravely, okay? So, you know, when I'm at a college, I think about, say, the faculty at a college, okay? And when we have these divestment fights, I'm guessing there's some faculty here, okay? Um, we need you guys leading, helping lead, helping work side by side with students to force divestment on you know, Western Michigan, it's got to happen. Um, and, and frankly, um, those of you who have tenure, I mean, you're the safest people in the entire world, you know? <laughs> if you're not uh, out front, then who will be? Um, and there's plenty of room for everybody else to help too, you know? I'm guessing that there are a number of people here who, if they aren't in college now, went to college at some point in your life. You guys are called alumni. Um, you may have noticed that your college retains an interest in you and <laughs> sends you an envelope now and again, and you should definitely, you know, when you have some money, contribute it to your college. It's a good thing, but you should, um, well, I, somebody gave, I was telling, telling people earlier, Somebody just gave me a prize for $50,000. And so I'm gonna just turn around and give it to my college, to Middlebury, where I teach, because I admire them. But it's coming with a note that says, um, you gotta hold this in escrow until you divest from fossil fuels, okay? So, um, um, 
it's an easy note to write, and you all should think about doing the same thing. I'm sure we're all going to leave here tonight with good intentions, but in order to convert that to action, um, who is your local coordinator, and how do we contact that person? There's 350 Kalamazoo. Is, where's Mark? Mark Miller. Mark Miller someplace here. He's up where? Well, he's, there's a table back as you leave, I think, where you can sign up, and I hope you will. And there's lots of people doing good stuff in this part of the world. Table up, I guess, near where I'm signing books, yeah. Um, um, but yes, that's exactly right. Um, organization is key here, and so we need you guys organized. And, uh, si and, and if you just sign up at 350.org nationally, too, we'll just kind of keep you abreast of what's going on and um, give you, you know, if we need you to come get arrested again, we'll tell you. And I've now, <laughs> I've now heard from a great many people who have told me now that getting arrested for this cause is on their bucket list, you know? So, <laughs> so you wouldn't want to miss out. That's the thing. Hi, um, I just, I'm a college freshman. I'm still pretty stupid, but to contribute to this movement, is there anything yet you recommend for the college students here to do? Like, Absolutely. Like beyond recycling, but just. Absolutely, so that's just the right question. Um, when you're in college, you know, you've got important work to do, you've got to study and learn and things, and you also exist a little bit in a kind of bubble, right, which is nice. It's one of the best things about college, you're a little bit in. So, you know, one of the things you can do is make sure that within that bubble, things are going as well as they can. Um, this place seems to be doing a good job with its infrastructure. You know, working, you've got a good sustainability coordinator working hard and making sure the campus is pretty green. So I think working hard to make sure the endowment was pretty green and the finances the college were green would be a really useful thing to do and a really helpful one. The point of divestment is not that we can bankrupt Exxon. We can't. But we can politically bankrupt them. We can make it much harder for them to, I mean, they sent a letter, Exxon, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, several others, sent a letter today to the president demanding that he build the Keystone Pipeline. So, you know, if you're invested in those places, then you're, that's your fight now. Um, and we need to be able to reduce that power to make people understand that they're in some way a rogue industry. And so that's what we'll keep trying to do. And there are lots of other things you can do. There's a great fight going on, you know, about the tar sands here. And there's groups in Michigan. Um, I see people from Michigan Cats right there who are doing good stuff about all of this. Um, um, so there's lots of good organizing opportunities around here. Just keep your eyes open, and we'll try to help point you in the right direction. Um, there's plenty to be done. And you will figure out how to do it. And you'll figure out how to do it gracefully, but firmly. Uh, I think one thing to be said is, when we come to colleges and universities, say, in divestment, there's no need to hate on our institutions. And, you know, um, um, instead, there's a need to say we need our institutions to live up to the ideals that they've been teaching us. Uh, you know, I mean, it shouldn't be too much to ask to a university that has a physics department that they pay attention to physics, you know? And <laughs> so there you are. Hi, so I just spent a year in Texas fighting the Keystone XL pipeline that's being Good. built. I'm a bit confused that, I mean, if you look on websites of 350 and the Sierra Club, you'd think that Obama was on our side when it's kind of brushed under the carpet that he actually expedited the Keystone XL South and many other pipelines. He went to Cushing to announce it. Yeah. And, I mean, isn't the Keystone a threat whether or not the northern segment is built? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I don't think there's any thought that, we're, that he's sort of on our side. I mean, we organized the biggest demonstrations against Obama of anybody in the whole six years he'd been there. So the, the six, southern half of the Keystone pipeline is getting built, and it's going to be used for bad things in any event to take shuttle oil, including some tar sands oil that's already in the country, down to Port Arthur, Texas. Now, the only part we're still fighting for and trying to, hoping we can still, I mean, people are still fighting hard to try and block the southern part even as it's being built, you know? And that's hard, and the people who are doing it are really brave and doing good work. Um, the part we're still trying to block in Washington 
is the northern half, the connection across the border. Uh, and it's the part where the president has authority because he has to sign this any time a piece of infrastructure crosses the border, he has to sign a permit for it. So that's why the, you know, why with the kind of leadership of the people living up in Alberta along the tar sands, we continue to fight hard on that part too, you know. Um, 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 we want to keep that 900,000 barrels a day in the ground up there. But yeah, I mean, we got to fight the southern leg of this, we got to fight other pipelines like the Alberta Clipper Embridge pipeline. We got to fight these coal ports along the Pacific. We got to fight um, the plans for huge new LNG gas terminals to export stuff off the east coast of the United States, the fracked gas that people are, we got to fight fracking, uh, which we are hard along those shores. That's why all that defense sometimes gets, to me anyway, depressing. And it's why I like to try to play offense too and why I think it's important we do this divestment stuff as well. So thank you for that work in Texas. Um, if we all were doing as much in as many places, we'd be getting somewhere. Thanks. Uh, hey, man. Uh, actually glad you mentioned that about the offensive. And uh, I've been kind of inspired by what's happening with the divestment and read a little bit about tar sands and how it's actually kind of a shaky market right now. Yeah. And uh, kind of wanted to just ask a clarifying, like, how many colleges do you think we would need? And is college divestment enough to actually shake the financial market to stop tar sands? None of it's enough by itself, okay? None of these things by themselves will do enough. There have to be many fronts in this fight. It's, you know, this is the biggest industry on earth, okay? So it takes many, many places. But how many colleges? Well, when by the time South Africa was liberated, 155 U.S. campuses had divested their holdings. That took about 10 years of hard work. Uh, we got eight campuses, I think, in the first 10 months. Um, here, so that's a start, but that means that there's a ton of work left to be done. And frankly, um, we, 10 years is a long time. Uh, you know, we really need this to happen more quickly. So, and I don't know whether it can. I mean, it, de I mean, it doesn't depend on, I mean, at some level, it doesn't, in the end, depend on me. I've, and it probably doesn't depend on you. I think both of us are working as hard as we can at this point on this stuff. It depends on people who aren't working as hard as they can and how much they up their game. That's all I got. Thanks, man. I was uh, interested in wondering how you would link climate change to a criminological um, aspect. How I'd link climate change to, to crime? To criminal behavior. To criminal behavior. Well, I'd kind of, in a certain sense, um, I'm not sure this is what you meant exactly, but I'd kind of link it the other way around, you know? There's a certain kind of criminal behavior. No, I, th I, think, I, I think you're gonna go where I want you to go. Leading in the direction yeah. of, um, <laughs> of, uh, of the problem we face. Now, it's mostly not like sort of, as usual, it's not like, I mean, as is often the case, say, in Washington, it's the things that are not exactly illegal that in fact are taken for granted that are the real crimes. Um, you know, um, we've watched these votes on Keystone time after time, and um, you can predict with unerring accuracy how any member of Congress will vote depending on if you know how much money they took from the fossil fuel industry. It's a better indicator than their party identification, than anything else. And, you know, I frankly, I'd always had a kind of sense that things weren't quite right in Washington or whatever, but I'd never spent any time there until we got in this fight. And it, it's painful to watch. I mean, I'm kind of a naive, my bent is toward a kind of naive patriotism, you know? I am, grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts. My summer job was giving tours of the battle green with my tricorn hat, you know? Um, talking about the beginning of the, American Revolution, and, and, and so it was uh, painful 
to go there and see that and witness it. To sort of witness behavior that's, you know, I mean, if it happened anywhere else, I mean, I know that y'all are, you know, Tigers fans, and I'm a Red Sox fan, but, um, <laughs> but I, know, I know that, um, you know, that if we were in playing for the pennant next week and um, somebody saw the owner of the Red Sox handing $10,000 to the umpire before the game, everybody, Red Sox fans, Tigers fans, would agree that it was outrageous behavior and it'd be all over the newspaper and, you know, scandal left. Well, that's, in Washington, it's just like, that's, everybody's, yeah, oh, that's what we do, you know? Um, which is, if you think about it, not okay and shouldn't be okay. And, and it's one of the reasons we should fight these kind of fights hard. We've got to get money out of politics, and one of the ways of doing it, it's hard to do it directly, as you know, but one of the ways of doing it is to take on the fossil fuel industry, because that's where the mostest of the money comes from. So let's hope we can make a dent there. That's a good question. Do we have time for a couple more here? Good. Just real quick. Um, uh, thanks for coming, and thanks to the Humanities Department for bringing you here. I wanted to let everyone know that there is a divestment campaign starting on Western's campus, and we meet on Wednesdays at 7 outside of the Peace Center in the Wesley Foundation. Um, and I just wanted to, I heard you speak a lot about the sacrifice communities who aren't often the ones who contributed to the carbon emissions. Um, and I wanted to hear uh, how you feel about those same sacrifice communities who suffer because of rare earth mineral mining that's required for um, solar panels. Sure. Um, look, there's no... As far as I've ever been able to tell, there's no... Uh, first of all, good organizing. Say again, 7 o'clock on Wednesdays? 7 o'clock on Wednesdays outside the Peace Center. Okay? Um, as for rare earth minerals and solar panels and things, look, there's no... We've got no energy source that doesn't come with some cost. Um, so we've got to do two things. One is use a lot less energy, which we're completely capable of doing. We waste huge amounts of it in this country, enough of it so that the first 20 or 30 percent is, I mean, it's like losing weight by cutting your hair, you know, I mean, it's incredibly easy. And, and, and then we got to clean up our act as best we can in, you know, with things like rare earth mining, but there's no way around some trouble, uh, I don't think. I mean, I, I, I've never, I wish I could tell you there was, but I don't think there is, and so it's all at some level a question of triage. Um, 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 the thing that we're doing to the climate is so overwhelming, and is, I mean, we're talking now, we think, about the possibility of losing 75% of the species on this planet in the course of the next century. Um, um, the benefit of the doubt, I'm afraid, has to go to solar panels and wind turbines and, and everything else we can think of for the moment, because we are in a hole like we've never been in before. That's just my sense of it. Thank you. Let's do one more. I don't want to keep people. Let's do one more question. You get the last. It's a lot of pressure. That's a lot you, of pressure. Um, hi, I'm Emma. Um, I'm a senior, but I don't go to Western. I go to Kalamazoo College. Um, we're a little baby blip of a school that's right next door. Um, um, but we are also starting a divest divestment campaign. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we are not quite as organized as our Western compatriots. We don't yet have weekly meetings. But um, so sort of the problem that we're running into with talking to our administration and starting to get things sorted out um, is that they have a bottom line, and that bottom line is money. Mm. And um, we're a small school. We have a pretty small endowment, mm. and that endowment funds a lot of things. It funds scholarships. It funds my sure. scholarship. Um, I don't want to see it vanish. Sure. But um, what do we say to that? So here's what we say to that. I mean, first we say, in some sense, you know, sorry, you got to do it anyway. I mean, it's, that's the price of, you know, whatever. But then we say, but in this case, you get a free pass because, in fact, there's immense amount of research showing that it doesn't come with any financial hit at all. Um, if we, if we, there's a group called the Aperio Group that backcast and showed that the theoretical risk penalty was almost nil. The Associated Press commissioned an independent study last year. They asked, what would have happened to an endowment of $1 billion that divested entirely from fossil fuel 
uh, 10 years ago? And the answer is it would have earned an extra $119 million over the last decade. Um, I don't know how much it costs to go to school at Kalamazoo, but no matter how much, that's still a lot of scholarships that you could have had that you forewent because you were invested in this stuff. Um, in fact, if you think about it, this is an opportunity for colleges uh, um, because in essence, you guys have inside information, okay? You have a physics department. It can tell you that we are sitting on this carbon bubble. HSBC and Citigroup, are two of our biggest banks, did a study last year. They said if the world ever took seriously its theoretical commitment to hold climate change to a two degree increase, then you'd have to cut the valuations of all the fossil fuel companies on Earth in half, okay? They'd be worth half as much because they'd have to leave most of their coal and gas and oil in the ground, right? So you are doing a great service to your college um, 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 by warning them of the bubble that they are sitting on top of, okay? And the only problem here is that you know, boards of trustees tend to have a lot of people who come from the financial industry, and they're committed to the idea that somehow money is a morally neutral thing and that it would be a big pain to have to, you know, well, you just gotta tell them no. Look, in this case, in this case, you need to listen to us. I mean, the general, the general model of a college or university is, if you think about it, old people tell young people things, okay? Um, <laughs> Which is, you know, more or less okay. I mean, theoretically, we've acquired some wisdom which we will now impart to you and so on and so forth. Um, okay, but in this case, the, the intergenerational ethic of climate change turns that on its head, all right? I'm gonna be dead in 20 years, 25 years, you know? So I will have gotten to live most of my life in a world relatively functional. Not true for you. Uh, by the time you're in your prime, um, unless we get things under control right away, your job and everybody else's is gonna basically be emergency response to an ongoing series of disasters and crises, okay? So in this case, you need to tell the trustees, time to listen to us, okay? On this one, our authority exceeds you. There you go. Thank you all very much.